Alright. Thank you very much, Thornton. Let's open our Bibles together at this time to the book of Romans, chapter 2, and verse 24. Romans 2.24 for our study in the Word of God this morning. <clears throat> Romans 2.24 will be found on page 1193 in the Church Bible if you need a little help finding Romans 2.24. Today's date is March 17th. 2024. Today's text will begin, <clears throat> excuse me, can't hit that high note, <laughs> will begin in Romans 2.24 and go on down to the end of the chapter in verse 29. And the title of this morning's message is God's Plan to glorify his name. God's plan to glorify his name. And we begin with the story of a crusty old army general who was reviewing his troops one day when he saw a new man in the ranks. So he barked out, Step forward, soldier. Tell me your name. The soldier said, Sir, my name is John, sir. And the general said, John, what kind of pansy army do you think I'm running here? I don't call men by their first name. It leads to familiarity and a breakdown in authority. What's your last name? The soldier said, My last name is Darling, sir. <laughs> and the general said, Okay, John. <laughs> you can step back now. <laughs> Then there's the story of a kind of overweight man who named his bathroom scale Buzz Lightyear. <laughs> because when he stepped on it, it went to infinity and beyond. <laughs> That's for all you Toy Story fans out there. And if you don't remember that movie, you're out of luck. <laughs> well, speaking of names, 4,000 years ago, the nations of the world refused to glorify God's name. So he judged them at the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11. And he announced his plan to teach the nations to glorify his name by creating a new nation and using it to teach the nations to glorify his name. So he saved a man named Abraham and multiplied his descendants who were called Jews and they became a nation called the nation of Israel. And all the other nations became known as the Gentile nations. But for Israel to teach the Gentiles how to glorify God's name. They were going to have to learn to do it themselves first by learning to obey God. Well, if you know your Old Testament, you know that instead they blasphemed the name of God 
by disobeying him. And they ended up teaching the nations to blaspheme him as well. As Paul's about to tell the Jews here in Romans chapter 2. As we saw in our scripture reading, he's been talking to unsaved Jews since verse 17. Where he said, Behold, thou art called a Jew. And now in verse 24, he tells them, For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you Jews, as it is written. Now, to begin with, the last Jew you would think would be guilty of causing anybody to blaspheme God was King David. But, when he committed adultery with Bathsheba, and then had her husband killed so he could marry her, the prophet Nathan told him in 2 Samuel 12 and verse 14, Thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. Nathan knew that when all the nations that hated Israel heard about David's great sins, that they would think, well, I guess the God of Israel must approve of sins like that. But, before you go looking down your nose at David, I remind you that when you and I don't live in ways that honor the Lord, we give occasion to God's enemies to blaspheme him as well. For example, in 1 Timothy 6.1, Paul told Timothy, Let servants count their own masters worthy of all honor. Why? That the name of God and his doctrine, the doctrine of the grace message, be not blasphemed. When you go to work to serve the boss as his servant, if you serve him poorly, he's going to say, well, I guess the God of Christianity approves of a poor work ethic like that. <clears throat> and if he's a Christian who is not a grace believer, then your poor work ethic is going to cause him to blaspheme the doctrine of the grace message in that same way. So don't be too hard on David if you're walking in his footsteps in that area and in any other area. But David understood that his failure to teach the nations to glorify the name of God and Israel's failure to teach him didn't mean that God's plan to teach them to glorify his name was going to continue to fail. And you can tell that from the way he prayed in Psalm 86, 8 to 12, <clears throat> where he prayed, O Lord, all nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee and shall glorify thy name. Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth and I will glorify thy name forever. David understood that someday he would learn to walk in God's truth instead of walking in things like adultery and murder. And that's when the nations would glorify God's name as well. And we know that God's plan will come to 
fruition like that in the kingdom of heaven on earth. Because in describing that kingdom, Ezekiel quotes God as saying in Ezekiel 36, 27 to 36, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and ye shall keep my judgments and do them in the day that I shall have cleansed you from all your iniquity. Then the heathen that are left round about you shall know that I the Lord build the ruined places as he establishes the kingdom of heaven on earth. Folks, it's in the kingdom that the Jews will be cleansed of all their iniquities, right? And that's when God will fill saved Jews like David with his spirit and cause them to walk in his ways and they will glorify the name of God forever. And then all the nations will see them doing that. And they will glorify his name forever too. And in your next reference, God made it very clear why he was going to do all that for the Jews. He said earlier in Ezekiel 36, beginning in verse 22 and going on down to verse 27, Thus saith God, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned, you blaspheme my name among the heathen. I will sanctify my great name, which you have profaned, and what? And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, I will bring you into your own land and then put my spirit within you. According to that verse, or those verses, the reason God is going to cleanse the Jews from all their iniquities and bring them back into their land is to sanctify His great name which they profaned. <clears throat> In other words, It'll be to benefit him, not them. And the fact is, folks, everything that God has ever done for men in any dispensation is for his glory and not for our sakes. Our salvation, it's a wonderful thing. But it's just a byproduct of God's eternal plan to lead the angels in glorifying the name of the Lord after the Lord raptures us to heaven. But in Paul's day, God's name was still being blasphemed among the Gentiles through the Jews. But now... That didn't catch God by surprise. You'll notice that verse 24 ends by saying that it was written that this would happen. <clears throat> and we just saw where it was written in Ezekiel 36 there. God knew ahead of time that Jews would be blaspheming God's name in the days right before the kingdom of heaven on earth. And don't forget, the kingdom would have come in Paul's day if the dispensation of grace hadn't interrupted the coming of the kingdom. So the, the Jews were, they, they were just doing what God knew they'd be doing. But, Paul knew here that the Jews would be thinking, you can't talk to us like that. We're the circumcision. <laughs> and you know, or he know, you know that he, they were thinking that because uh, in verse 25, he went on to tell them, for circumcision verily profiteth. <laughs> 
if thou keep the law, the law of Moses. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. You probably know the Jews were known as the circumcision. And they were breaking the law of Moses in Paul's day, as we also saw in our scripture reading, uh, in those verses leading up to these verses. Back in verse 21, they were stealing. Back in verse 22, they were committing adultery. And they, they were committing all kinds of other sins as well. So they were guilty as charged. But now, if you're not sure what circumcision is, don't make me draw you a picture. <laughs> Men are born with a foreskin that God told Abraham to cut off. In your next reference, in Genesis 17, 11, where he told Abraham, Ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. Now a token is another name for a sign. Back when I used to ride the subway to Brian Bible Society when I worked for Pastor Stam as a young man, uh, in those days the CTA would sell subway tokens. So you didn't have to carry a pocket full of change to get on the bus or the subway. And uh, the token, that, those subway tokens I should say, were a sign that you paid all the money to get a lot of those tokens. And that's how the word token is used in the Bible too, as you see in your next reference, where Romans 4, 2 and 11 says that Abraham received the sign of circumcision. See how that works? Genesis called circumcision a token, that verse says it was a sign. <clears throat> Circumcision was a physical sign or symbol of the covenant that God made with Abraham promising him and his seed eternal life. But when God gave the Jews the law of Moses later, and the law said that a guy had to be circumcised. Circumcision became more than just a sign. It became a debt. As Paul says in Galatians 5 and verse 3. Every man that is circumcised is a debtor to do the whole law of Moses. If a Jew got circumcised, like the law said he had to, it obligated him to do all the rest of the things, the 613 other commandments in the law of Moses. I like to compare it to the law we have that says to have the rights of an American citizen, you have to obey the law that says you have to become an American citizen. If you obey that law and become a citizen, you can't stop with that law. <laughs> because that law obligates you to do all the rest of the laws of our country. And if a Jew obeyed the law of Moses that said he had to be circumcised, it obligated him to keep all the rest of the law of Moses. But, to keep the rest of the law, you had to keep it perfectly. As we see in those verses that keep coming up in our study of Romans in James 2, 10 and 11. Whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all the law. If you commit no adultery, yet if you kill... Thou art become 
a transgressor of the law. So, here in verse 25, if a Jew wanted the prophet that Paul's talking about there, he had to keep the law perfectly without ever breaking it one time. And listen, that word prophet there is talking about the prophet of eternal life. That word prophet is often used to talk about the prophet of eternal life. For instance, in Mark 8.36, the Lord said, What shall it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And then James says in James 2.14, What doth it profit? Though a man say he has faith and have not works, can faith save him? So you see, prophet used to be talking about the prophet of eternal life there as well. So here in this passage, Paul is telling the unsaved Jews that the only way to get the prophet of eternal life is, as verse 25 says, if thou keep the law. If thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. And suddenly they'd be like the people who no longer had a covenant from God promising them eternal life. They'd be just like the Gentiles who never had any promise from God of eternal life. Now, I'm sure that unsaved Jews were not liking what they were hearing from Paul so far. And they were not going to like what he says next, even less. Because in verse 26, he says, Therefore, <clears throat> if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? <laughs> Paul told the Jews if an uncircumcised Gentile manages to keep the righteousness of the law perfectly he becomes circumcised in the eyes of God and he'd have a promise of eternal life from God and I can tell you the last thing that unsaved Jews wanted to hear was that their God <laughs> would give loathsome Gentiles eternal life. But they couldn't complain about it because God made them that offer 1,500 years earlier. And their people had had that offer for a millennium and a half. Look what, they, look, look what they said when Moses gave them the law in Deuteronomy 6, 24 and 25. The Lord commanded us to do all these statutes and it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do what's that next word? All these commandments. So, it's not like the Jews could complain if God counted a Gentile's uncircumcision for circumcision if he kept the righteousness of the law because they had first dibs on salvation through the law, didn't they? Of course, uncircumcised Gentiles were no more able to keep all of the law than circumcised Jews were. So, Paul's really talking about what we call a hypothetical situation here in verse 26. But, if there was a Gentile who could keep the law perfectly, it would make the Jews look bad by comparison. And that's the point that Paul goes on to make in your Bible now in verse 27 <clears throat> where he says, And shall not uncircumcision 
which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge you Jews. You Jews who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law. Uncircumcised Gentiles didn't have the letter of the law. God didn't give them the two tables of stone with the Ten Commandments on it, the, the letters that God wrote there. But uncircumcised Gentiles had the law, what does it say there, by nature. We talked about that. Men know by nature that it's wrong to lie and steal and kill and commit adultery. And what did Paul say about that back in verse 14 in your Bible? In Romans 2.14 he says, For when the Gentiles, <clears throat> which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these Gentiles, having not the law, are a law to themselves. When the Gentiles who didn't have the law of Moses obeyed what they knew by nature, they became a law to themselves. And verse 27 is saying that if a Gentile managed to fulfill the law that he was to himself by filling it full and keeping it perfectly, he would judge the Jews by comparison. You say, well, how's that work? <laughs> well, if you give your kid ten rules to follow, and he doesn't follow them, but the neighbor's kid does follow them, even though you didn't give him any rules, it makes your kid look bad by comparison, doesn't it? And if Gentiles who didn't have the law were able to fulfill the law, even though God didn't give them the law, that would judge the Jews by comparison. Because verse 27 says the Jews had the letter of the law and not just the law by nature. And then, to top it all off, Paul goes on to tell unsaved Jews that they weren't even Jews, <laughs> as we see in the last two verses of our text, beginning in verse 28, where Paul says, For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Now, just imagine walking up to a Jew and then telling them, you know, you're not really a Jew. <laughs> you're just a Jew outwardly in the flesh because you're circumcised in the flesh. I mean, if you want to make a Jew mad, that'll do it. <laughs> but Paul's not trying to make the Jews mad here. He's trying to get them saved. He's trying to tell them that only saved Jews were Jews in God's eyes. Jews who were Jews inwardly. Unsaved Jews thought they were saved just because they could trace their family tree back to Abraham. And they had always thought that. John the Baptist, he knew that they were thinking that when he told them to get saved. So he told them in Matthew 3, 9, Think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. Who are you telling us to get saved for? For God is able of these stones to raise up children to Abraham. He made Adam out of dirt. He could make children of he can make Jews out of stones, right? John was trying to tell them that just being related to Abraham physically 
didn't mean they were saved and related to him spiritually. And Paul's trying to tell them the same thing here. And he's also trying to tell them that being circumcised physically didn't mean they were saved and circumcised spiritually. Because as he says, their hearts have to be circumcised if you want to be saved. And listen, Paul isn't springing something on them that they'd never heard before. Because Moses told the Jews in Deuteronomy 10, 15 and 16, The Lord had a delight in thy fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He, he delighted in the fathers of the Jews. And he chose their seed. Even you, you Jews, above all people. So what? So you can sit there and bask in his glory? No! So circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart. Moses told the Jews, just because you're God's chosen people who are circumcised in the flesh doesn't mean you're saved. You have to circumcise your heart if you want to be saved. So the, the Jews should have known that from Moses himself. And they also should have known that <laughs> circumcising their hearts wasn't something they could do. Because Moses also told them that God was going to have to do it for them in your next reference. In Deuteronomy 36, he told them, The Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed, that thou mayest live. And he meant live eternally. They were already physically alive, right? So, unsaved Jews should have known from the law of Moses that to get eternal life, they needed a circumcised heart that only God could give them. So, Paul's not springing something new on them here. He's just being a good prosecuting attorney. A good prosecutor takes the defendant's evidence and uses it against him. Unsaved Jews thought that circumcision was evidence that they were saved. Paul reminded them that circumcision was just evidence that they needed a spiritual circumcision to get saved. Now here it helps to remember what I've been saying. In Romans 1 and 2, Paul is presenting God's case against Jews and Gentiles by charging them with their sins. So he could go on in Romans 3 and 4 and 5 to tell them how Christ died to pay for their sins. But now the thing about spiritual circumcision was back in the Old Testament God never explained what it meant for him to circumcise a heart until he circumcised our hearts. Did you know this morning, if you're saved, that God saved you by circumcising your heart? In speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Apostle Paul, the Apostle of us Gentiles, tells us in Colossians 2.11, In whom ye are circumcised, circumcised, with the circumcision made without hands, a spiritual circumcision, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. In other words, God put off the whole body of the sins of your flesh, every sin you ever committed, by the circumcision of Christ. And that's not talking about his physical circumcision. 
the one that Joseph and Mary brought him to the temple on the eighth day to get done by the priest when he was eight days old. That's talking about Christ's spiritual circumcision. The one the prophet Daniel predicted in Daniel 9.26 when he said that after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. But not for himself. Well, let me ask you, isn't circumcision a cutting off of something? And whatever Christ was cut off from, it wasn't for himself, according to what he says there. So, what was he cut off from? And who was he cut off for? Well, the prophet Isaiah saw a vision of the Lord's cutting off, and he tells us the answer to both those questions when he describes that vision in Isaiah 53 and verse 8. Speaking of Christ, he was cut off out of the land of the living. Who for? For the transgression of my people, is Isaiah's people was he stricken. Jesus Christ's spiritual circumcision took place when he was cut off out of the land of the living. And hey, we got a word for being cut off out of the land of the living. We call it death. And Isaiah said that Christ died for the sins of his people, the people of Israel. And as you know, later on, the Apostle Paul revealed how he was also cut off from the land of the living for our sins as well. And when we believe the gospel, Colossians 2.11 just told us, we're spiritually circumcised in whom? In Christ. In other words, we're cut off from the land of the living. When Jesus Christ died, we died with him. As Paul makes very clear in your next reference, in Romans 6, 3 and 4, when he said, so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ <coughs> by that spiritual baptism that 1 Corinthians 12, 13 talks about elsewhere, as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. That, like as Christ was raised from the dead, even so we also should walk in newness of life. After Jesus Christ died, God raised him from the dead and gave him a brand new life. And then for the next 40 days, he walked around in newness of life. And then he ascended in heaven, now he's sitting in heaven with that same newness of life. And when you believe the gospel, God took you back to Calvary and made you one with Christ in his death and his resurrection, and he gave you a brand new life too. And now you're walking around in newness of life. And that's how God circumcised your heart. He cut you off from the land of the living. He cut you off from your old life and gave you a new one. A life that is as eternal as the one he gave the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's how God circumcised the hearts of the Jews as well. And now we know that. And that explains what verse 29 of our text means when Paul tells the Jews that circumcision is in the Spirit. It's the spiritual circumcision that saved a Jew and made him an inward Jew, a saved Jew. And not the letter of the law, as he says there. The letter of the law said that Jews had to get physically circumcised. But that couldn't give them eternal life because 
circumcision was just a sign we saw, right? A token. And signs and tokens and symbols can't save anybody from anything. For instance, animal sacrifices were symbols of Christ's sacrifice. And they couldn't save anybody. But the Hebrew says the blood of bulls and goats could never wash away sins like his blood could. And the Lord talked about another symbol in Matthew 12, 39 and 40, where he talked about the sign of the prophet Jonah. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man, the Lord Jesus, be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Well, I don't have to tell you, the sign of the prophet Jonah can't save anybody from their sins. All you get from that is a wet prophet. But the death and burial and resurrection of Christ can save people from their sins. Here's another sign that can't save anybody. The law said in Exodus 31, 13 and 15, My Sabbaths ye shall keep, God told the Jews, for it's a what? It's a sign! It's a, it's a sign between, uh, between you and me, me and you. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest. But... Resting on the Sabbath was just a sign of the resting that the Jews needed to learn to do in Christ. As he himself told the Jews in Matthew 11, 28 and 29. He told unsaved Jews, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you what? Rest! Learn of me and you'll find rest unto your soul! not just for your body on the seventh day. Listen, if you order a hammock from Amazon and you just can't wait till it gets here, you just can't wait to start resting in your hammock, you might go back to the website over and over and just gaze longingly at your hammock while you're waiting for it to arrive, right? But, you don't keep gazing at the picture after it arrives. You start resting in the hammock. And you don't have to rest on the Sabbath now that you're resting in the salvation that the Lord Jesus Christ gave you. So, signs can't save you. And the sign of circumcision couldn't save the Jews. So, in your next reference, Paul tells Jews and Gentiles, unsaved Jews and unsaved Gentiles, once they get saved to believe the gospel, we are the circumcision. Which worship God in the letter? No, in the spirit. And rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Unsaved Jews in Paul's day had all of their confidence in the flesh of their physical circumcision. They thought that's what was going to save them. Paul says we have our confidence in the spiritual circumcision that we have in Christ. The one we got when we believed the gospel. But, having said that, I should make it clear that there are no saved Jews living today in the dispensation of grace. Hey, huh? What? <laughs> there are Jews who are saved, but there are no saved Jews. Because Paul says in Galatians 3, 26 and 28, in Christ Jesus, in the body of Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ. Once a Jew gets saved today, God puts him in the body of Christ and no longer sees him as a Jew. There are no males or females in Christ either. We're all one in Christ. Of course, looking back at our text, 
That begs the question of why Paul used the present tense in verse 29 to say he is a Jew who is one inwardly. He doesn't say a Jew used to be a Jew, which was one inwardly. He says he still is. And the answer to that question is that Paul is not talking about saved Jewish members of the body of Christ here. He's talking about Jews who believe the kingdom gospel to get saved before the body of Christ began with Paul. They were still around when Paul wrote this passage in Romans. But a couple thousand years later, now, now that the transition from law to grace is over, there's no such thing as a saved Jew. Only saved Jewish members of the body of Christ. Now all of that explains what verse 29 means when Paul says at the end there that the praise of spiritual Jews is not of men, it's of God. You see, the word Jew comes from Jacob's son, Judah. And the word Judah means praise. As you see in Genesis 29, 32, and 35, when Judah was born, Leah conceived and bare a son, and she said, Now will I praise the Lord. Therefore, she called his name praise. She called his name Judah. So, I know it's late in the message and I'm almost done, so think this through. What Paul is saying, he, he's making a play on words here. A play on words that Gentiles like us are likely to miss. I, I missed it till I looked up on my own notes last time I taught notes. <laughs> but Jews in Paul's day, they'd be sure to catch it. Because they would know that Jews were not called Jews until this happened in your last reference. In 2 Chronicles 11, 14-17. Jeroboam ordained him priests for the devils, for the calves, the golden idols, the graven images which he had made. He made a priesthood for his idol. And what happened when he did that? <clears throat> Out of all the tribes of Israel, such as set their hearts to seek the Lord God of Israel instead of idols, fled from Jeroboam. They came to Jerusalem. And when they did, that strengthened the kingdom of Judah. The tribe of Judah lived down south. Jeroboam led the northern ten tribes of Israel into idolatry. And all the northern Jews who sought the Lord left the north to go live near Jerusalem with the southern two tribes of Benjamin and Judah. And those two tribes became known as Judah, right? And here's the point. Only the Jews who refused idolatry like that were to be praised of God. The other Jews showed they weren't saved Jews. They weren't inward Jews. Because they stayed up north and kept worshiping those idols. And that's the point Paul's making at the end here. That's the point. He, he's saying only save, the only saved Jews are the inward Jews. They're the only ones to be praised. They're the only ones who are Jews to be praised. The rest, the rest of them, you know what they did up there? They made, well, the rest of these Jews here, they made an idol out of circumcision. Right? Thinking, it could, don't you think God saves you? They thought physical circumcision saved you. But don't look down your nose at them because Pentecostals make a God out of tongues. 
They say you can't. You, some of them say if you're not saved, uh, you're, you're not saved unless you speak in tongues. Some Baptists make an idol out of baptism. A lot of them say you can't be baptized, you can't be saved without baptism. But you know what? A lot of grace believers make an idol out of the grace message. Make too much of that. If you haven't met any of them, I'll introduce you to some. Jim probably hears from them at BBS. <laughs> But listen, I, I, I know it's getting late. i got to add here that just because we're spiritually circumcised doesn't mean we are spiritual Israel like a lot of pastors teach. They say that after the Jews crucified Christ, God took all of Israel's promises away from them and gave them to the body of Christ. But you know that can't be because God promised Israel they'd live in the kingdom of heaven on earth. That's why the Lord taught them to pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But we're not going to live in the kingdom of heaven on earth. We're going to be raptured to heaven to live in God's kingdom in heaven. So we pray for the body of Christ to go and not for the kingdom to come. I like to say that people who say we're spiritual Israel don't know if they're coming or going. <laughs> By the way, if you ever talk to anybody who, who thinks we're spiritual Israel, well, and, the, and that God gave us all their promises, ask them if they believe that God gave us all of Israel's curses too. <laughs> and if not, why not? Ask them graciously. But listen, if you want to say we're spiritual Israel and you want to take Israel's good things, you got to be willing to take the good with the bad, right? And finally, just because this passage is talking about Jews doesn't mean there's nothing we can learn from this passage. Because <clears throat> I can tell you that there's a lot that goes on today that mirrors what unsaved Jews were doing back in Paul's day. They thought physical circumcision saved them, right? And physical circumcision was just a symbol. And today, Roman Catholics believe taking communion saves them. Look it up, I check. That's still what they believe and teach. We know the bread and the cup are just symbols of the body and blood of Christ that saves us. And as I mentioned, there's, there's Protestants guilty of that too. There's Protestants who think water baptism is necessary for salvation. But we know it's just a symbol of the cleansing that we have in Christ. And now that we have that cleansing, then we no longer need the symbol. If you're not sure what I mean by that, let me, when you go to the kind of restaurant that has pictures of the entrees on the menu, you might order and then continue to gaze hungrily at the picture on the menu. But once your entree arrives, You'd be a fool to keep gazing at the picture. And that's Paul's point in this passage here. Paul's point is not to be a religious fool and keep gazing at the pictures and symbols of Christ that we find in the Bible. Now that you've got the Savior that they symbolize. Heavenly Father, what a wonderful salvation is ours. It thrills our souls to look back and learn all the details that they didn't know at that time about salvation and how it worked. Years ago I heard someone say that the Old Testament is... The New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the, well, something like that. <laughs> the New Testament reveals the Old Testament. And we're seeing that this morning in this passage here.
So we thank you, Father, that you knew all along what you were going to do for us, and you knew all along how you were going to do it. We praise you for it, and we praise you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.